My name is Mike. Uh, we're going to start this uh, presentation now. Uh, I'm an employee of Nagios Enterprise along with Nick. He's a part of our development and support staff. He's going to be talking about uh, Nagios performance tuning today. So enjoy. All right. Hey, guys. All having a good time? All right. Um, well, uh, I guess I don't need an introduction because Mike, Mike took care of that. Um, but uh, what I'll be covering today is some performance tuning. Um, uh, and I'll get more into specifics about what I'll actually be tuning. Um, and uh, just the baseline of what I'm going to be going over um, is uh, I actually did some tests. Um, I didn't do tests for everything that I'll be covering today, which uh, seemed kind of incomplete, uh, but I couldn't do tests for some of the stuff. And uh, basically what I did is I had a, a baseline virtual machine that I ran the systems on, um, and I ran them all the same. Uh, and then the then what I'll be covering is uh, the actual tuning that I did. Uh, Mike, Mike talked about it last time, uh, RAM disks. I'll go into it a little more detail, what you actually get out of it, um, how to implement it, and when you should, when you shouldn't, stuff like that. Uh, also, offloading my, MySQL with NDO utils. Um, and offloading that to an actual different server, um, what the benefits are, uh, wh when you shouldn't do it, when you should do it, just stuff like that. Um, also, memcached, um, when you should use that, when you shouldn't, what it means. Um, also, uh, passive checks, kind of get into how you can actually get more for performance using passive checks, when you shouldn't use passive checks, when you should, what the performance benefits are, um, and then we'll do a final Q&A. So pretty much the same setup as last time. Um, all right. So the first thing I'll go over is what the, the actual baseline system was used for these tests, so you might be able to apply it to your actual systems and if it could actually suit all of your systems. Um, uh, the, I used a VM running CentOS 6. Um, I gave it two CPUs with one gig of RAM, and the hard disk was a 20 gigabyte disk. Um, the host version was VMware Workstation 7.1.4. Um, I don't think that there's been any major major increases or decreases in disk I.O., which is mainly what I tested with um, the later VMware versions. But if you guys know of anything, you know, be sure to pipe up and let me know. Um, uh, as far as the, the actual disk it was operating on, it was operating on um, uh, SATA 2, which is capable of 3 gigabits per second. Um, I'm not exactly sure what VM can, uh, VMware can actually throughput to, to the PCI Express bus, but um, that, that's what it's capable of. Um, as far as the version of Nagios that I was running, I was running Nagios Core 3.2.3. .3. Um, it had 1,002 hosts on it and 4,012 services. Check frequency for everything was five minutes, and I did use the NDO Utils Event Broker. Um, so this is just the baseline of what it is, um, so you guys can apply it to whatever you guys are using. Um, so then what I actually did use to check um, is pretty similar to what Nagios actually uses to check. If you guys go look in the performance info for Nagios, it gives you like how long it was waiting to do stuff. Um, I used IOSTAT, which is the same tool that Nagios does use. And the, method, the harvesting method that I used is I just ran IOSTAT, this, this IOSTAT-x 6060 right into a file.log. Um, I did it for a clean, and then I did it for... Um, the RAM disk and the MySQL offload and the memcache. I didn't do it for passive checks because that is that was outside the scope of this test. That would have been a massive project. Um, and I ran it. Um, uh, so then after the, the test was performed, I reset the virtual machine to a clean state and then redid all the changes and ran it again just in case we hit some some spike, something something strange happened. You guys know how testing goes. Something strange always happens. Um, and then I picked the test with the least extrema. Um, while that may not be the most statistically relevant way of picking which test to use, um, it did iron out some of <coughs> some of the strange tests that didn't jive with what my prediction for what the actual um, r result would be. Um, and then I allowed for two hours of normal operation before um, going through and running the IOSTAT method again, just to let stuff even out, find an equilibrium point. Um, and then I parsed the log files and plotted them um, using some custom scripts. I, they're pretty simple, so there's no creative math going on in any of these. Um, uh, so the metrics that I'm going to be using for the comparisons are WS, which are writes per second, <laughs> scheduled to the hard disk, um, reads per second, the await time. And the await time uh, is 
kind of independent of the speed of your disk. Um, the await time is how long in the queue your file actually waited before it got picked up and said, okay, I'm gonna write you to the disk now. Um, I'll go into the reasons why I picked that one instead of uh, the actual total time that it took for this piece of information to be taken and written to the disk. But just for now, um, that's the one I used. And then um, the average queue size, that's um, how many items were actually waiting to be written to the disk. That it could be helpful for a couple reasons. We'll see why in a bit. Um, and the, ad, the average size, the average cluster size that is written to the disk. So if you've got one thing that's only one byte long being written to the disk, that's totally different than one thing, one megabyte long being written to the disk and takes different I.O. times. Um, so those are the metrics that we'll be using for comparison. If, if these need to be reset later, because this is you know, kind of in code up here, I, I realize just um, say something and I'll, and I'll rephrase it. Um, so the first thing I'm going to cover is RAM disks and uh, implementation of reasons to use them, reasons not to use them, and then I'll show you some of the specs that I pulled out of the, of the actual performance data. Um, so Mike kind of went over this in the previous discussion, uh, but what a RAM disk is, um, I'm sure I don't need to explain the basics of, of RAM to you guys, but I will just so that we can um, get the concept of why a RAM disk would matter. Um, Mike actually mentioned the status.dat file and the objects.cache file, both of which Nagios writes to and reads from a lot. Um, and they're usually just small writes, um, and there's just a lot of, lot of the writes and reads. So um, the pro of a RAM disk is it's got incredibly fast I.O. Like, um, there is no seek time in RAM. Um, it has a direct bus straight to the RAM. It doesn't have to go through some intermediary like a, like a, like a SCSI controller or a SATA controller or anything like that. It's just a direct, directly from the processor to the RAM. So there's no, there's near zero latency time. Um, it can act as a separate volume to alleviate I.O. issues on, a, on other particular volumes. So if you've got some hard disk like an SDA zero, you can, you can mount something to um, make it appear as, that there's, as though their they're one volume is two or two volumes is one. Just however, however you set it up and you, and you want it to be like that, you mount it as a, as a RAM disk in whatever logical way you find necessary. So it's kind of a tertiary um, a pro, but it, it still should be mentioned. Um, the cons of, of a RAM disk is that it doesn't hold state on restart, which Mike went over. Um, so you don't want to put um, your super secret um, code that's going to change the world on the RAM disk, but that's not what this, te what this presentation is about. Um, it actually uses RAM, um, so it's not ideal for large files. Typically, um, the objects.cache and the status.dat files are usually below 20 megs, unless you've got some unusually large installation, which I'm sure some of you have. But, uh, but for the most part, you don't need to worry about it. Um, it is still something to consider, though, because you should um, just see what the sizes are, add them up, and that's about the size that you should make your RAM disk. Um, well, obviously a little bit bigger to account for some growth and some miscalculation. Um, also, miscalculations will cause more harm than good. If you assign some massive, massive RAM disk or you didn't assign enough, um, it will start it will try and write to that RAM disk, and when that RAM disk is full, it will start paging like it, like it would virtual memory, um, which will actually cause more CPU calculation. Be like, okay, this can't, this can't be on this RAM disk. I've got to page it to the page file. So make sure that if you are going to implement this, make sure you're actually doing your math right and that you're not actually shooting yourself in the foot. All right. Um, so the things that should go on here are uh, like storing off and access small files, like what previously mentioned, objects.cache, status.dat, um, service-perf data. Most of the stuff in the Nagios um, var directory could go in this in, onto a RAM disk, and you would see some benefit from it. I mean, obviously, it's probably not a big deal to have the Nagios.log in the RAM disk unless you've got debugging turned to one and every option set to it, then it might actually make sense, but then you're going to get a log file that's massive and you're going to run out of RAM disk really quick. Um, also, uh, beware of the scaling issues, which I mentioned earlier. Like, if your RAM disk is not allocated big enough, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't even have it in the first place because it can become very large, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you'd run into paging issues, and 
it just becomes, it actually slows down your system if it's not allocated properly. Um, so then as far as um, implementation of the RAM disk, it's uh, very easy. Uh, you don't have to like schedule downtime to do this to your system. Uh, it's, it's just mounting a RAM disk, literally. The, um, so the, you'll just have to calculate the size, um, and then you'll mount it as a temporary file system. Um, and then if you want it to come back next time you restart, then you'll have to put it in the FSTAB so that it will automatically mount that, that folder that you want. Um, and then you'll also have to edit, edit your nagios.cfg. Um, all of these are pretty trivial, tri trivial pursuits. And then restart the Nagios service so that it starts writing all of those files or um, it'll, like the objects.cache and status.dat anyways, because that's a, that's a state thing with the, with the Nagios service. Um, the good thing about this is that as opposed to what I'm going to be talking about later, this doesn't actually increase points of failure per se. Uh, say if you were to offload your MySQL database, that would obviously increase your points of failure where if something went down, your Nagios would be out of commission. This, not so much. I mean, if, if your RAM goes, then, well, you lost your Nagios server anyways. Um, then the meat and potatoes of the issue, um, the actual results of the test. This is the uh, request reads per second. Um, as you can see, like my, my statistical methods, I, I picked the one with the fewest extrema. And in this case, the extrema would be the super high spikes. So this is the one with the fewest. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's, there's some pretty high spikes on both of them. Um, and this is obviously the request reads per second, and then this is over time. Uh, and each one is, is every, um, every 60 seconds, 60 seconds, 60 seconds, and then that's after 6 minutes, 12 minutes, all the way up. Um, and, and as you can see, there was some there, there's some close extremas here, like uh, this this the one in the light blue is the measurement when I um, was using a RAM disk, and in the dark blue it was the just the just the vanilla using um, Nagios with NDO utils, and then just putting the objects.cache and the status.dat on a RAM disk. And uh, what, what I tried to break down was um, the actual average. This R value is the average of the uh, Read, read requests per second. So with the RAM disk, there was 85% um, of the read requests as opposed to the vanilla read requests. So there was a pretty significant drop to the read request to the hard disk, um, which gets pretty signi significant when you're running a very large Nagios install. As far as the write requests per second, um, there was much bigger spikes, which for some I, I don't have an explanation for why there were bigger, there were bigger spikes with the RAM disk. However, there were. Um, and you really didn't come out too much on top using a RAM disk as far as writes to the actual um, hard drive were. Um, so it's kind of a wash there. Um, now, one of the other things that was interesting was the actual queue length, like the amount of files that were in queue to be written to the hard disk. Uh, there was significantly less, like there, there, there's still some extremas with the RAM, uh, but overall there was many, many, the, the queue to be written to the hard disk was much longer. Um, as you can see with the actual R value, there was about half as many, like the, the queue was about half as long. Um, and the reason I'm talking about hard disk statistics like this, I guess I'll go off on a little tangent, um, is that there's like three metrics really that, that really matter, like the CPU load, um, the amount of RAM load, which, which kind of matters, and then like your disk I.O. load. And it seems like, uh, as I've encountered, disk I.O. loads are, uh, it's just one of the statistics that gets forgotten about a lot, like do I have enough space? Uh, but it's actually super important because you know you're basically just archiving data here, and if you can't keep up with the with the reads and the writes, then you know you're not going to be able to keep up with them, and you're gonna it's going to overtax your system. So, my goal here is to more focus on the disk I/O, which is why these graphs are only focusing on disk I/O, so that you can skip you can set up your system like with a proper raid setup to uh, account for all these uh, these ins and outs and these queue lengths and these read requests per second um, and to actually see the benefit of um, implementing these actual changes like a ram disk like people say yeah a ram disk it helps but it doesn't really say how it helps um, and that's kind of what I'm aiming to do with these graphs and uh, 
so yeah, so if you know, this seems like an abstract, non, non-essential thing to do, that, that that was my goal. Maybe just help help with scheduling of what what you, hard disk configuration you're going to use as your Nagios install grows. Um, so, so anyways, um, you can see that the queue length was half as long, um, which is pretty massive. There's stuff waiting in queue far less time. Um, and, and then as far as the actual wait length that it was waiting in the queue, um, it was about 86% of that time. So that's a 15% drop in the, in, in the amount of time that it was waiting, uh, which is significant. And it, Now, okay, so that's so those were pretty much all the tests I, I ran on the RAM disk because it came out to meet my predictions that it, there would be less, like fewer for fewer reads per second. I, I anticipated uh, fewer writes per second, even though it pretty much came out to be a wash. Also, the average queue size pretty much came out as expected, and I think most people would expect the, the queue size to be shorter because it's not actually writing a lot of stuff to the actual disk, and the, the await time was significantly shorter. Um, now, see, the, th the thing to keep in mind here, and th this was just offloading two things, the objects.cache and the, excuse me, and the status.dat. That those are the, just the two things. This had, um, this was, this was running PNP for Nagio, so it was still computing all of, all, it just everything was still running. It's just these two files made that significant of a difference in, in some of the disk I.O. metrics. Um, so it is definitely improvement, and it will definitely help with overtaxed hard drives. So if you guys are like on the fence, like don't know if it's worth it with your with your disks to do this, um, there's really no cost of doing this other than if you're running really close to the metal with with your RAM. Yes, sir. I I bet. Do you know how much room that that would that that would take? I have 50 megs. Okay. Awesome. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, thank you. Can you tell me why you think that the read and write percentage is so thin on the number of reads and writes it could be exactly the same in both scenarios, but per second or something like that, right? Oh, yes. Uh, the amount required per second. Because uh, it's actually, um, uh, those are requested reads, not actual reads. So it, it was actually requesting fewer reads per second. And that, and that, um, the reason I expected that to go down, and then it did go down, is because there was fewer things that needed to be written to the hard disk at that time, because there were. Um, can you rephrase your question? So was it like cut in half, or what was it? It was about half. It was about half. Okay, well, I, yeah, I did not look at that metric. I was looking for percentages like this, per se, but that would be another metric that would be good to look at. Because the queue size is used in IO staff, right? Yes. Yeah. How is it any different by different storage if it's already in storage? Um, nope, I just, I just did it with the temp. FS and then uh, the, I think the Nagios one was uh, EXT3. Cool. Yeah, right. Uh, 
well, I'd love to talk about that with you. Um, but uh, but moving on, um, uh, that's actually what I was going to go into next. Probably not as in depth as what you were talking about. Um, but uh, offloading MySQL with NDO utils to a not local machine and what that will actually do to your local machine as far as disk I/O goes. Um, so basically, what I'm just talking about is moves of writing and reading um, the database to a separate server and uh, what what it, good it does and what it doesn't. Um, server move does it, it, it doesn't have to be a super powerful database. And when I'm talking about I'm talking about a like a small to medium sized Nagios installs, um, not the massive Nagios installs. Um, so the database server itself doesn't have to be some ridiculous beast of a machine. It just has to be something that. Um, uh, at least for an instance for this, when I had a thousand, a thousand hosts and four thousand some services, um, I moved it to a machine. I because I've got a, a Pentium four sitting around with uh, just some random old IDE disk in it, and this kept up kept up with it no problem. Um, so the pros of this um, would be it, it alleviates I/O t CPU time that uh, MySQL uses on your local disk, which I'm sure I don't need to tell you guys, um, and it actually creates a path for redundancy and I/O value high availability if you, it becomes an abstraction layer so that you don't have to worry about the actual database, like the single database, you just worry about the actual information store that it's at, um, which, is, which is useful to have extra, abstraction barriers like that. Um, the cons are uh, if you lose connection to it and that's lights out, you're not getting any, any of that information. Um, uh, you, you do see a slight increase of wait time and results. Um, as I found it wasn't incre incredibly noticeable. Um, but I can see some instances like some massive installs or if the server that you hosted it on, the SQL database on was not fast enough, then you would see some significant read and write latency. Um, bandwidth utilization I don't think is that big of a deal nowadays because uh, I find it highly unlikely that you saturate a gigabit connection with what you're writing to your SQL database, but however this is for medium to small installs, I'm sure with a large install that would be totally doable. Um, and this, but, and it also requires additional hardware and virtualization. So unlike the RAM disk, this is not a cost-free option. Um, so that's what it does, so it alleviates the CPU I.O. on your central Nagios. Um, uh, what I found, my SQL typically eats about 50% of the CPU time larger installs. Um, I'm sure you guys have your all your own, you, you guys have looked at that yourself. Um, uh, the, my, having MySQL and performance graphing on one machine, um, that's just an unreal amount of disk I.O. And as Mike spoke about it earlier, and I'm sure you guys have all experienced that if you can get one, if you can offload one so that, that MySQL can think on its own machine and the performance graphing can think on its own machine, then you're going to have a lot more disk I.O. on your local machine to do something else with. And that's kind of what this whole thing is about, is just being able to abstract those things out and to get the, your local resources for yourself. Um, this also allows for, for scalability, like you could cluster your SQL servers, you could, you know, it just creates a level of abst abstraction so that you can worry about other things or delegate it to a team that's always working on their on the MySQL like that's what they do they they optimize their MySQL database they that's just what they do so they don't actually have to think about how Nagios really relates to it um, the implementation is invasive uh, generally requires downtime um, because you have to set it up it, it generally it would just be like a restart Nagios but it does require you to go down for a little while, back up the MySQL database, move it move it to the new one, and then start again. Um, and it adds a possible point of failure. As I said earlier, it's lights out if you lose connection. So, um, uh, And then it sends traffic over a network. Um, if you're super concerned about security, there's, there's ways you, you can encrypt it, but it's something to keep in mind if you're worried about phishing or anything you find your, your network to be unsecure. Um, and all it really consists of is editing um, your config files. If you're using NDO utils, it's just NDO 2DB. Um, if you're using Nagios XI, it's just config.ink.php, and Nagios QL is just the config.php in the settings folder. Um, so it's nothing, it's not a huge pain to edit the actual config files to do this. It's getting the MySQL set up so that it will start talking with your Nagios. Um, and then once again, there's these graphs. Again, um, I did try, uh, I found uh, something I didn't expect, which we will cover 
uh, later. Uh, the request reads were significantly lower um, on the actual local disk. Uh, they were they're about 76 percent of what they were before. Um, I actually expected it to be a little high, like or a little lower, higher, whatever you want to, however you want to think about it. Uh, but there was a definite improvement in the amount of um, read requests per second. Now this is the thing I didn't expect. Uh, the actual write requests were much higher. They were twice as high. Um, I really, I was completely flabbergasted. I ran this test several times um, because I thought the complete opposite would happen. Um, so what I ended up doing was looked at the actual size of the clusters that were being written, and they were um, about 70% of what they were in the Nagios install. Um, so perhaps it offsets. I, I don't know what was actually being written, what was causing twice the amount of writes, um, but it is something that might need to be kept in mind if you are thinking of doing this and your disk is pushed to the to the max already um, that it does it does incur a lot more writes however they're smaller writes so they won't take as much time uh, yeah I, I was just completely flabbergasted by that um, and the actual size of the queue was actually half as well so that's um, that kind of jives with with what was um, said earlier, twice as many writes, but um, the actual size that was being written was was actually smaller. So the so this actual um, the actual size of the queue was smaller. Um, so it kind of it, it it washes out to be a, a benefit for your local Nagios XI server, which I would certainly hope so if you're offloading MySQL to it. But um, did you have a question? Um. Uh, NODB? Uh, um, no, actually, I do not know what, what format it was. I apologize. Um, then the actual time in queue was, was half the time in the queue, so uh, it was significantly less strain on the, uh, on the disk is what I can conclude from these actual graphs, to, despite the sheer increase in writes per second. Um, so the, just the just the breakdown. Um, there's definite improvement. Um, there's like a fifth. There, it, I guess what, what what it boils down to. If you haven't done this and you have a spare server sitting around um, and you have like a half hour to to do this, uh, I would definitely suggest that you just put MySQL on a on a database that's not Nagios, and you will uh, be able to use your disk I/O for other things like graphing performance data or you know. Write just whatever you want to do with the disk I/O. Um, there's smaller files in queue, but but there are more writes. So, um, I, I, in the end, I, I don't think it came out to be a wash for sure. Even though the writes per second were just skyrocketed. Um, next thing uh, was memcache. Um, any of you guys use memcache here for your? No, okay. Um, do you get pretty good results with it, or decent? Okay. Um, for those of you who don't know what, what memcache is, I'll just uh, give a quick crash course on what it actually is. Um, it creates like a collective of caches. It's like a cloud cache. I really, it pains me to say the word cloud, but it's kind of it's kind of what it is. Uh, you, you've just um, basically what it is. You have uh, like a memcache user, and you create a bunch of memcache servers that are all like on on a network like network accessible. And so when it gets a when, when your database gets a request. To, um, to to read something first first thing it does is it consults its 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 cache its, its cache out in the cloud and if they have something they send it back um, if not then it hits the database so the entire point of memcache is that it you keep stuff from hitting your database every single time you do a read so you can see how it would come out to be you'd come out on top if this um, if you were doing doing a lot of reading of the same. In information, so it could use the disk I/O to read other information from other requests instead of stuff that it read a million times before. Um, so, the, and, and the nice thing about this is it is it provides some. You did, this is completely scalable. You can do this for so, tiny installs. You can do this for massive installs. You can do this for whatever one. You, you can install one, one memcache server, um, and that's what I did. I didn't I didn't have the resources to install many memcache servers. But um, 
you, you, you can do this for however big you want it to be due. Like this uh, memcache was originally, originally developed and used by LiveJournal um, just so that their databases wouldn't get completely swamped from accessing the entries and all of that good business. Um, uh, so it, it avoids the database hit. Um, and you know, I put up here just what, what its actual thought process is when it actually makes a query to the database. Um, so then um, the pros, like if, if you can just set up a memcache server somewhere, just somewhere, just on any old machine, this, this can even be lower specs than what, than what, uh, what, what the MySQL database was. Um, it, it, it can run memcache, that's, that's fine. It doesn't have to be super fast. Um, uh, and it just allows for massive scalability. Just the, the I, sky's the limit, literally. As many memcache servers, um, I'm sure to a point you get to diminishing returns where you've got your entire database memcached or something like that, then obviously it doesn't matter. Uh, as far as the cons, uh, it can also increase the latency of the requests. Uh, if, the, if, if the network that it's running on, um, you know, networks that it's running on are never perfect, and I'm sure we're all aware of that. Um, uh, the, in, the improper coding, which is something you don't really have to worry about, can actually return um, improper results where if it tries to um, read from the database and there is a previous write to the data database, it will actually return an old value instead of, a, instead of the proper new written value. Um, and this can also create a lot of network traffic. So um, if, you know, once again, now, networks keep getting faster, but um, when we just keep using up the bandwidth as, as quickly as they make it faster. Um, implementation is generally generally pretty easy. Um, if, if you're running on on some modern Linux distribution, it's really. I mean, I can't think of. Well, I know Debian, I know Red Hat. Uh, the, this the, the actual memcache daemon is in all, both of both of their repositories. So it was as simple as just yum install memcache and then properly setting up the like the hosts and the Etsy. The, like the Etsy host and the firewall rules, and that was that was as easy as it was, um, and it's pretty non-invasive as well. Um, something that should be mentioned is memcache. Um, I did not implement it with Nagios 3.2.3. Um, I installed Nagios XI alongside Nagios 3.2.3, um, and Nagios XI since version 1.4 has has memcache ability, so that's what I used for these tests. Now to the graphs, um, uh, the actual read requests. Uh, I was I ended up running these tests multiple times too because I didn't think that they were right, but these were the numbers that I kept getting back. Um, there were absolutely significantly um, fewer read requests to the hard drive. It was it was insane. Um, Fifteen percent of the of, of the read requests, and this was just with one memcache server somewhere else. Um, so that I, I was I was pretty shocked. Um, but as far as the write request went, that was another ball of wax. Um, there was eleven times as many write requests w with the memcache server, uh, which I guess I don't completely have an answer to that um, as far as why it's such a massive increase in writes. Uh, but but once again, I I went and decided to look at the size of what was being written, um, and it was significantly smaller, like in terms of like blocks on the hard drive of what was being written, twenty seven percent the size of what it what the vanilla not Nagios XI was. Um, so that may explain why there was just it was writing smaller things more times per second, and that's. That's really the best that I can come up with because I, I was just shocked with the 11 times as many of the writes. But moving on, uh, the average length in the queue was actually longer as well. Um, so it was you know 1.5 times as long. Uh, so that's generally not not a good thing either, which makes me think that something like this, something so small, something with a thousand hosts, uh, 4,000 services probably doesn't benefit from, from a memcache setup nearly as much as a larger install would. Um, and then the actual time spent in the queue uh, was 25% of a vanilla install. Uh, now, as far as um, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I, I got those, met, those those metrics mixed up. Uh, this is the average length of the queue. There's there's 1.5 times as many things in the queue. And then this one, there's there's 25% amount of the time spent in the queue. Um, so there, there was an obvious there's an obvious uh, decrease in I/O demand as far as memcache went, but um, these numbers lead me to to believe that it, it would serve a lot better to have this on a large install. And if you've got a smaller install, it's probably not worth your time to do it. Um, and you know, once again, this you know, it was just a it was just a one Nagios XI server and one memcache server, so this doesn't really accurately portray scalability. However, it does demonstrate that there that it well a for one it does affect your disk I/O. Okay, so we do we do know that, and um, that it I think it it turns out um, that it actually reduces the the amount of disk I/O. Just uh, if you if if you do the if if, if you run the numbers um, it, on, on this instance, uh, it's not a massive actual effect on the disk I/O, uh, but. If, it, if you've got a massive server that really can't even handle um, its main, it, like it just just surviving, then then this memcache would um, would would make it doable. And if you had many many memcache servers, then it would it would reduce the amount of of disk I/O on the local machine as well. You said your memcache was on. Where was MySQL? Um, MySQL was on the server. Every five minutes. Every five minutes, because when you were looking at the graphs on the thumb drive, you were seeing these spikes. Right. right. So in the Tiger Council, when it called medium or valuable information, um, was there an explanation for the spikes that led to the biggest spike? Um, no, uh, I, I didn't have an explanation for the spikes. Um, it was something that I could not nail down to a certain I.O. Um, it, whether it was some some log being written somewhere or something else happening with the with virtual machine hiccups with with the hard drive on 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 my on my server, no, I, I, I couldn't nail down what these actual extrema were. Um, which which brings us to passive checks, which uh, which I, I I believe Mike talked about um, and talked about them. Quite well. I'll just try and you know fill this in. Um, it, it creates a nice separation of labor. Um, if you guys aren't aware of what passive checks are, it's when um, a remote a remote host runs the check on itself and just sends it to Nagios, and Nagios doesn't have to schedule the to schedule the time to do it, run it, process the results. Well, it's <laughs> sorry. It, it's, it still has to process the the results. It's just the benefit that you get is Nagios is not running the plugin. Um, so it, it, it creates um, yet another abstraction barrier that's kind of nice where you can, if, if you plan out your, your server and if it's viable for you to have all passive checks, you get this, um, you, it's just a, um, a nice division where you can, um, uh, where you don't have to worry about Nagios actually executing the checks. Now, of course, that's just an ideal environment and probably probably wouldn't really see that very often. Uh, but so then Nagios would, wouldn't become much of an executor. It would just become more of a receiver of, of information, which I guess in the ideal world, that's the way I would set up a Nagios install. But um, once again, not always ideal. Um, so d with the Nagios execution versus the remote execution, it brings some complexity. You have to worry about um, setting up the actual execution on the remote machines, which you know you probably would have to do anyways, but it's just something else you'd have to think about. You'd have to worry about the firewall setup as far as what was between Nagios and the, and the and the remote machine. But you know, once again, if you're running NRPE to run checks on your um, your, your remote server, you would have to worry about that as well, anyways. Um, it eases some cross some cross platform compatibility issues. Um, NS Client plus plus is a you know it's something it's a it's a great it's a great tool for Windows, um, uh, but it, if that didn't exist or we run into a lot of issues where NRPE doesn't it doesn't compile or there's not a binary available for some like some AIX systems or like IRIX or something like that, 
Uh, so we kind of have to think outside the box as far as how people are going to be checking those. Um, if if you can have it send something to the to the port eighty socket with with um, N, NDRP or NRDP, uh, that's enough. That's all you have to do. You just have to write a shell script that will execute something, and then you send it to um, send it to port eighty with with a couple other you know communication protocols. But um, then that's really you don't have to worry about finding the proper compiler to compile NRPE, making sure you've got all of the all of the dependencies that it needs to compile and run. Um, and this also um, uh, this also allows for some ridiculous checks. Um, not that NRPE doesn't allow for some ridiculous checks, but I do recall someone ran a check that took several days um, of the computer system, um, and that was uh, that was that, that was interesting. It's you know of course it's doable um, with NRPE. I do believe you would have to set the timeout to something insane though. Which is something you, you generally don't want to do. So if, if you do want to, you know, get statistics across several days, then really I think this is the only realistic way to do it. So that's one benefit. And you know, it it doesn't tax your Nagio system. Your Nagio system can just be off, you know, skipping down the skipping down the street. And then as soon as it receives this this result, it's like, okay, sweet, here's a result. Log it. Done. Um, now, it, it, if you're thinking about it in a bigger ecosystem, passive checks uh, probably consume more CPU cycles, like total, net, everything. Because um, if, if you think about it, a passive check, what it does on your host system, your host system has to have something have to has to have something going where it's scheduling this passive check, and then it runs this passive check, and then it submits this passive check. So then it goes on down the network. Nagios grabs it, it goes in the Nagios command pipe, and then it just works like any other check. Um, so if you, if you think about it, it if, if you're working in a, like a massive, massive corporate environment where you're worried about like CPU cycles as a whole, um, passive checks will, will consume more CPU cycles, but it will alleviate a lot of the hurt on your Nagios server because it doesn't actually have to run you know, the Perl script or check NRPE or, or or any of that. Also, um, freshness checks are necessary, um, but counterproductive. And by counterproductive, um, I don't mean a bad thing, but uh, just like the, the ideal the ideal thing about active checks. I mean, passive checks is that you did, Nagios doesn't ever have to worry about what's going on with that thing. It's just kind of like you know the, the kids leave the house, and if they call, they call whatever. That's fine. Um, but if you do do freshness checks, then you do put another another um, schedule on Nagios's scheduler, where it's okay. If I don't get a, if I don't hear back in five minutes, then run this plugin, which is kind of what it was gonna do, anyways. It was gonna okay every five minutes run this plugin. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. I'm certainly not advocating that you don't use freshness checks with your um, with your set up, but just keep that in mind that if if you're going to be using passive checks, just use the passive checks. It, it, it's, it, it's certainly the, the, the actual Nagio scheduler doesn't take up a lot of CPU cycles. I, I, I can't argue that the, the biggest thing that takes up the CPU cycles is the actual plugins being, writ, uh, being run. Um, but if, if you can avoid running a plugin by by using passive checks, then you know just keep in mind that if you use freshness checks, you're going to be running a plugin anyways, and then maybe you should use active checks. Just, just something to keep in mind. Um, all right. Um, and there's a couple common types of passive checks, and I just want to talk about how expensive each one of them is. Um, the, the the big ones are NSCA, which you know I'm sure most of you, if you haven't used, you've heard of it. Um, it's the it's the go-to as far as um, as far as passive checks go. Um, and as far as expense, like time expense for you, the Nagios admin setting it up, um, is, it's, it, it, it's not long, but it's not short. You have, to, you, have to, you have to run the config, you have to write the king, config file, and it's just, um, but once you get, up, it, get it up, it's done. Um, and it's just expensive on, on the host system, because you know, it just submits it straight to the Nagios com command pipe, just as if it were any other plugin. Um, so it's really not that expensive to do. Um, NRDP is the same way. Um, only this, you don't have to really worry about firewalls unless you're blocking port 80. 
Um, basically, all, all you have to do is make sure that the tokens match between your actual um, Nagios install and what's sending it. Um, and as far as these, there, there's no real. I mean, you, you have to have you have to have Apache and in Nagios waiting and ready to listen to this NRDP check. But other than that, that's really all that it costs on your local system. Um, SNMP is also is also um, a, pr a pretty common passive check, um, and it typically is one of the more expensive ones. Um, as far as traps go, when traps get sent, um, it it has to reference all of those uh, the the raw OIDs against what is actually in the MIB files and find it and then submit it to Nagios. Of course, you you can you know you can get around that if 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 you absolutely don't want to see what the OID translates to and you are just really awesome at reading OIDs, um, then, I mean, maybe maybe you could get up and talk about, about it, but, because I would really like to hear that. Um, but it, it, it is very expensive. Uh, we, had a, we had a client who was running, I think he was running four, 400 SNMP traps. Um, he was getting 400 SNMP traps like every five minutes. And it was, it, I gosh, I'm sorry, I can't pull the number out. I just, I just remembered it. But it was some, it was just obscenely. He, he actually had to stop that, like that, that frequency of the checks because, um, it was just an obscene CPU usage because of it having to receive the check. Okay, this I need to translate. Okay, I've got this massive list of MIBs. Let's let, let's compare it and see what it actually means. Um, so it just seemed. It was it was just very expensive to do it SNMP wise. Some, sometimes you really don't have an option to not use SNMP. Um, like I, I don't really want to think about taking a Cisco IOS and somehow mangling NSCA on it if that's even possible. Um, uh, but then as far I, I was talking about I, ideal design, um, and uh, I I don't know. This is obviously a very subjective subjective idea. Um, but uh, if, if if you can, oh my goodness, I didn't see the time. Um, uh, anyways, just the, the the ideal design, just uh, you know, passive checks. It, it would be ideal um, if the Nagios, the central Nagio server, didn't really have to do very much thinking as far as executing the plugins, and it just caught them and did what Nagios does best, which is scheduling things um, and then <coughs> sort sorting the data. So anyways, I guess I didn't really re realize the time. I wanted to open it up to questions um, a while ago. So um, uh, questions, comments? All right. Like, like right out of the box, what you should do as soon as you install Nagios? Yeah, I mean, so parental, for example, right? It's not just the SNMP server, right? Both modules are different. So why is this different? Should you call that to make it? Um, you know, I, that's, 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 a, that's legitimate. And, uh, but I think the whole uh, mindset of Nagios was just kind of letting you do whatever you wanted to do with it and not, like, and trying to stay out of the way as much as possible for you. You know, obviously there's there's some rules that are broken there, like with NDO utils generally coming co coming with Nagios now. But um, that's a that that's that's a legitimate point. I um I would do, do one thing that that might uh, wreak some havoc with that is uh, like the actual size of the RAM disk. However, that that would only become an issue once your install became so large that the default size of the RAM disk wasn't big enough. Um, that's those are really the only two points I can use to play devil's advocate for you because you know I think that's a good idea. Anything else? Because I think that just hit the fifty minute mark, so I'm gonna have a break and get something to eat. Thank you.